Hey guys, today we are talking about the Sony ZV-1 with an in-depth review informed by over 12 months of heavy use. Want proof? Then check out the 30 or so videos on my channel. This is probably going to be my longest video to date, but it's also going to be one of the most comprehensive, detailed and test footage filled reviews of the ZV-1 out there. Will this be the ultimate camera for vlogging, a mini cinematic sensation and king of compact companion cameras, or will it be a bigger disappointment than the last time I tried taking a gym selfie? Let's find out. There is a lot to cover today, so you'll find a full list of timestamps along with relevant product and video links down in the description. Those video links have all sorts of tutorials, deep dives and extra test footage for the ZV-1, so I will highlight the most notable ones as we're covering each relevant topic. And if you enjoy this video, then like, subscribe, and let me know any questions or thoughts down in the comments. But right now, let's start by talking about core features. The ZV-1 has a list price of £700. I've seen deals for less than that, but the camera is still new and popular enough that you won't find lots of deep discounts. For that money, you get a 1-inch sensor paired with a built-in retractable lens. This ranges from a 24mm to 70mm full-frame equivalent field of view, with a wide f1.8 to f2.8 maximum aperture, which should provide a decent mid-zoom range and potential for some nice bokeh. The camera gives you 20.1 megapixels of potential resolution, and the ability to shoot in 4K up to 30 frames per second and 1080p up to 120 frames per second in normal modes. Plus, ultra slow motion which gives you 1080p up to a huge 1000 frames per second. We will talk more on that later and in my view it's super cool but rather than discussing my view let's discuss field of view. The 24 to 70 range gives a modest zoom range but it does cover a lot of the most popular and useful focal lengths like 24, 35, 50 and 70 millimeters. The wide end at 24mm is nicely balanced and works great for landscapes and scene setting. It's also a good fit for vlogging, but there's a few caveats there which we will get to later. The telephoto end at 70mm gives decent reach and some nice background compression, which can create a pleasingly different look and some really nice cinematic results. But there are some extra crops to consider which impact field of view. Shoot in 1080p with no stabilization or standard steady shot, and you will get the full widest view. Switch to 4K and you will get a slight crop in. Turn on active steady shot, you get a further slight crop. Here you can see the difference. While this crop can detract a bit from a vlogging perspective, it's pretty easy to mitigate, whether you use a cheap selfie stick or an accessory like the Ulanzi wide angle lens. I've talked about both, including how to attach lenses and similar accessories to the ZV-1 in other videos linked down in the description. If we continue thinking about the vlogging use case, our next most important consideration is stabilization, and the ZV-1 provides a few solid options. Built into the camera, we get two levels of digital stabilization. The first of these, standard steady shot, does a decent job with simple static shots like pans or tilts, but can't really stand up to more involved motion like walking. The other option, active steady shot, crops into the image as mentioned earlier, but aside from that downside, it's a good option and does a solid job with everything that standard steady shot can do, as well as more challenging scenarios like walking, and you might even be able to get usable results when running. That is still more stable than my therapist says I am, so it must be pretty good. Active steady shot is not perfect, but it does a good job in a lot of situations, plus you still have another option to try. Catalyst Browse, which uses gyroscopic data recorded by the ZV-1 to allow stabilization in post-production. The results can be great, with minor trade-offs including a crop which you can control to balance stabilization and field of view, the need to shoot with a couple of specific settings, and the need for sometimes slow rendering in post-production. But it's a great extra option. I'm still disappointed it's not a list of cats you can browse through on the camera. Shut up, Pass Dave. What a moronic comment. Everyone knows you won't get cat browsing on a camera at this price point. The other stabilization option is to use a gimbal. I'm a fan of the Xiong Crane M2 with the ZV-1, and thanks to the super light construction of the camera, a light and compact gimbal like that one will work great and make any shaky, jittery footage nothing but a blurry memory. Speaking of blur, not only reminds me of the sometimes catchy Brit pop band, but also brings us on to our next topic. Bokeh. The ZV-1 gives us a wide aperture f1.8 lens, which should be great for that bountiful bokeh background blur, but 
The other big factor in bokeh is sensor size. The one inch sensor of the ZV-1 means we get bokeh equivalent to approximately f4.8 on a full frame sensor. There is a video explaining these concepts in the description, but the short version is that you'll get nice looking but fairly modest bokeh using an arm's length vlogging type of distance. I should also say that the f1.8 is the maximum when you're not zoomed in at all. As soon as you start zooming in, that max aperture decreases a little until it reaches f2.8 at the 70mm end of the zoom range. This doesn't change any of our observations, and the zoom compression at the tighter end of the focal range still provides nice bokeh. At the opposite end of the zoom spectrum, the ZV-1 excels at close-ups and can achieve some really smooth, attractive bokeh when you're shooting really close to your subject. Plus, you can get even more close focus bokeh by using a macro adapter attachment for some very cool results. There is a built-in macro lens in the previously mentioned Ulanzi wide angle lens and even larger magnification macro adapters covered in the links. Bokeh balls look good with a generally round and nicely sized appearance, always good to hear about one's balls, but there is a little bit of artifacting visible inside them at times. This isn't a significant drawback and I would be shocked if your audience noticed. You will also find a deep dive all about maximizing bokeh down in those links, but for now, I can summarize the last few sections by saying the image quality of the ZV-1 is generally great. The 20.1 megapixel sensor provides detailed oversampled 4K that I can seamlessly mix with footage from my much more expensive full frame A7C without any reservations. So the ZV-1 can achieve excellent image quality, but how does it do for design and build quality? In a lot of ways, really well. We get a compact camera design, meaning it has a built-in lens which retracts when the camera is switched off. While that limits the different looks you can achieve compared to interchangeable lens cameras, it does an amazing job for pocketability. And yes, that is definitely a word provided you have no follow-up questions. At just 294 grams and with dimensions of around 10.5 by 6 by 4.4 centimeters, this camera will fit easily in any bag and most pockets. One of the very best things about the ZV-1 is how easy it is to take anywhere and how that leads to getting spontaneous shots you would not capture otherwise. You also get the fully articulating flip screen, super useful for vlogging and shooting yourself, but also great for vertical video and extreme high or low angle shots. There are three ports on the right hand side covering audio for external mics, a micro USB port for charging and data and a micro HDMI port for video output. A pretty impressive selection on such a tiny camera. Less impressive is the shared compartment that houses both the battery and SD card. On its own, not too bad, but combine that with the fact the door is super close to the quarter inch screw mount and you have a design that makes swapping out batteries or SD cards much more of a hassle whenever the ZV-1 is on a tripod, gimbal or similar. There are solutions to that, like using cages or USB power, but it is still a dumber design than my idea for an ultra realistic pirate costume. Step one, use tool A to ensure eye patch is ultra realistic. Okay. Uh, other design drawbacks include the petite battery giving only 60 to 70 minutes of 4K video recording and a slightly lightweight feeling, largely plastic construction. But both of those are trade-offs for that powerful pocketability. So I'd say on balance, the overall design is still strong. A wider strong suit for Sony is autofocus, where it has been one of the market leaders for the last few years. The ZV-1 picks up that heritage and delivers awesome AF results pun intended. We get eye autofocus and tracking. As you can see, it does a great job tracking subjects even when people are moving around like they ate the wrong type of mushroom. I actually can't remember many, if any, times that the ZV-1 wasn't nailing focus when in good light. Finally, something I can't remember which is not repressed trauma. Thanks ZV-1. There is also touch tracking focus which works well for locking to a focal point or subject and can create nice rack focus shots for that cinematic aesthetic. There's a whole video of cinematic focus techniques like that in the description. And it also joins to our next topic, manual focus, which is hampered a bit by the camera design. 
we don't get a focus ring like we would on an interchangeable lens, so instead we set manual focus using the control wheel. That movement on such a small and light camera can introduce shake into your footage if you adjust manual focus distance while filming, so it's not always the smoothest option, though my aforementioned guide has some workarounds to help you still achieve great results. On the bright side, manual focus does let us achieve the ZV-1's insanely close minimum focus distance of around 3.5 centimeters, really nice for detail, bokeh, and even modest macro shots. So, focus overall is a good experience, and autofocus is excellent in good light, but how does it fare with our next topic? low light. Generally, the ZV-1 does okay in low light. It's possible to get really attractive results and dark, moody vibes. There's a huge amount of tips on low light in a couple of guides I made which show a lot of further examples, but that potential is offset by a more challenging user experience. Autofocus definitely struggles when things get darker, and while it's possible to boost ISO to compensate, the ZV-1 image does get pretty noisy pretty fast, and I would not recommend going much over ISO 3200 generally. Those issues are a consequence of sensor size, so if you're comparing the ZV-1 to a full frame or APS-C camera with an f1.8 lens, then it won't look great. But if you're comparing to a smartphone or action camera, the ZV-1 is going to kick more ass than Jean-Claude Van Damme in a movie about a fighting competition. Which brings us to something which is a strength for both Van Damme movies and the ZV-1 slow motion. Here, the ZV-1 actually has features that far exceed its bigger and pricier siblings. Slow-mo deserves a special mention since the ZV-1 not only provides good quality 100 or 120 frames per second slow motion, but also gives a high frame rate mode for ultra slow motion at 240, 480, and even 960 frames per second, or the PAL equivalents. The results are more insane than a Nicolas Cage highlight reel. There are detailed guides to both standard and ultra slow motion linked below. But the short version is that these features can achieve some amazingly cool and unique results, and they are a genuine selling point for the ZV-1 that you will not find on most, if any, of the realistic alternatives. Into the last couple of categories, but there are still some important features to cover. First up, audio. The ZV-1 has a built-in directional three-capsule mic, which you are hearing right now. The onboard mic is marketed as being great for capturing audio in front of the camera, and it includes a dead cat, or wind floof as I prefer to call it, to reduce weather noise. As for shooting outside and vlogging, check out these examples. Okay, ZV-1 audio test. Somewhat windy day, but we have the special wind floof attached to the camera. What do you guys think? Is this usable? Given the amount of ambient noise we get, even with the mighty wind floof, I'd avoid relying on the onboard mic outdoors unless you want all that ambience, perhaps for nature shots, for instance. <laughs> Lastly, before our conclusions, there are a few notable extra features. First up is product showcase mode. This uses eye autofocus, albeit without the tracking box being visible, until you hold an object up closer to the camera lens, and the ZV-1 will then change focus to that object. This is great if you show lots of products, but it's also a generally quite useful option to have. Next is the bokeh button, or background defocus feature. This is helpful for beginners, but it's not a real feature. It just puts the camera into aperture priority mode. I've got you covered if you need info on that, link in the description. Last and more substantial is a built-in ND filter. It can only be switched on or off and only has three stops, so there's no fine control or huge range, but it's still a very nice addition to help control exposure. Thumbs up, but does the Sony ZV-1 get an overall thumbs up from me? The answer? Hell yes, even more so than the end of Terminator 2, and this time without making me cry. The ZV-1 has a lot going for it. It's a vlogging and cinematic powerhouse in a pleasingly potent, pocketable package, with most of the same features you'll find in bigger, more expensive cameras from Sony and others. It also brings great image quality, a solid set of stabilization options, and with a little technique, you can get a big bunch of beautiful bokeh. Add in great features like the comprehensive suite of picture profiles and amazing slow motion options, super useful flip screen design and helpful product showcase mode, and you've got a very compelling package. 
There are drawbacks though. 4K is limited to 30 frames per second when 60 would have been nice. Battery life is okay rather than good. You can't change your options anything like as much as with an interchangeable lens camera or rely on the ZV-1 to dominate in low light like it can in good light. Add the fact that stabilization is decent, but you might expect even more from a camera built for vlogging. The slight cropping in when shooting in 4K or with active stabilization and the silly battery and SD card placement. And it is clear that the ZV-1 is not perfect. But no camera is, and while the issues are minor or easy to mitigate, the core experience of the ZV-1 is consistently fun to use, consistently able to put a smile on my face, and consistently surprising in how such a small package can produce such hugely impressive results. Overall, I can strongly recommend the ZV-1, and I get a huge amount of use out of mine. And that is it for today. Massive thank you for watching, especially making it all the way to the end of this longer than usual video. If you enjoyed it, then like, subscribe, and let me know any questions or thoughts down in the comments. If you want to know more about the ZV-1, check out the comprehensive playlist on the channel. But most importantly, until next time, take it easy.